Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Hello and welcome to this week's Painting of the Week. And I'm at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford today with Matthew Winterbottom. And we're going to look at uh, an artwork that he's chosen called The Great Bookcase, uh, designed by William Burgess and painted by 13 or 14? Well, 14, including William, yes. Oh, OK. Um, well, first question is, why, of all the amazing objects in the Ashmolean, why have you chosen this one? Well, this is a kind of monster of an object. It's three metres tall and incredibly brightly coloured. The entire surface is decorated with, with um, designs and pattern and, and animals and uh, scenes of ancient and modern history. So it's, it's quite an extraordinary object. Uh, it's only been in the museum since 2016, even though we acquired it in 1933. But when it was acquired in 1933, it was thought to be just too Victorian for 1930s taste, and it was banished to various um, uh, places. And it's only when we read did this Victorian gallery back in 2016 that we were able to bring it back and incorporate it within the pre-Raphaelite collection where it really belongs. It's a kind of pre-Raphaelite piece of furniture. So it's extraordinarily important and rare uh, and in remarkable condition. So this is why I'm sort of choosing it. And could you, obviously um, everyone listen, listening to this should know by now to go to the Seventh Art Productions website to look at an image uh, or some images of this artwork. Um, but could you just briefly describe to those who are out walking or don't have access to a computer at the moment what we are looking at? Well, this is a bookcase. It was made for William Burgess, who was an architect and designer in the mid-19th century, who was slightly crazy. I mean, he was, a, he was obsessed with the French 14th century, 13th and 14th century, a part of the Gothic Revival movement. And he designed this for his um, own studio to house his books and art and architecture and poetry. And it's called the Great Bookcase because it's, 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 it's essentially a kind of um, a rectangular block. It's three metres tall with a kind of Gothic top. And then these panels on the front, which are on the front of the doors, and each one is decorated with a different scene. Uh, and the scenes really tell the story of uh, arts and architecture and poetry. Uh, and one side is the pagan arts, and the other side is the Christian arts. And each panel on each corresponding door talks to the other one. So there's one on poetry, one on architecture, uh, one on sculpture, and on painting. Uh, so, and each of these were painted by different young artists that William Burgess contacted uh, and asked to c collaborate on this great piece of furniture, really in the spirit of the kind of medieval way of working. So a bit like Ruskin, who we've been talking about earlier, he was, he, he, he was kind of rejecting the 19th century and, and going back to a kind of medieval golden age of collaboration when artists all worked together on these great works of art. And this cabinet itself is, is based on surviving uh, 13th and 14th century cabinets in French cathedrals um, with this painted decoration. And it belongs to this very short-lived fashion for painted Gothic revival furniture that's first appeared in the late 1850s and peaked really with this cabinet which was shown at the International Exhibition of 1862. Now most people will know about the Crystal Palace of 1851 uh, but the next big one in London was 1862 which was equally as important, equally as big and spectacular but is often forgotten about partly because the building wasn't as loved as much as the, the Crystal Palace and was pulled down immediately but it was on the site of the uh, Natural History Museum in South Kensington where we are now and it attracted six million people over the, over the year when it was up and this cabinet was the uh, sort of centrepiece of the so-called medieval court, which Ruskin, which um, Burgess had put together to really showcase the kind of Gothic revival, which was the kind of fashionable style they were pushing. Uh, in the 19th century, there was a great kind of, it's called the Battle of the Styles, this great search for, for a style that would really represent what the 19th century was. And there were many, many revivals, all this kind of interest in styles of the past, styles of foreign lands, non-Western art, and um, things were put together to try and find, and there was a great kind of uh, a sort of um, uh, uncertainty about what was suitable, what, what, you know, what would be the most suitable style for the 19th century. And, and in the end, you end up with this plethora of different styles from all over the world uh, and from various parts of the past. And this cabinet, even though ostensibly it's Gothic, when you look at it, it's got, uh, it's got Japanese elements in it, it's got Egyptian, it's got Roman, it's got Greek elements in it, um, uh, showing this interest in the past that the Victorians had. 
And as an example of colour, this is also important. We tend to think of the Victorians being quite a gloomy sort of period, and we think of um, polluted cities, we think of um, Dickens writing about these slums, um, we think of Queen Victoria wearing black, or uh, black and white photography even, you know, is colourless. But actually the Victorians loved colour, and this is a vividly coloured piece of furniture. Uh, and um, there was a whole revolution in colour in the 19th century, and in fact many of the pigments used on this cabinet were new. You know, there was a whole revolution in science and technology in the 19th century, which comes out of that very industrial revolution, which people like Ruskin were worried was colouring the world black. But actually, vivid colour becomes accessible to many, many more people. The Victorians start looking at the past. So on this cabinet, we see there are, there are scenes of Egyptian life here, brightly coloured. The Egyptians, of course, loved colour, and all this amazing archaeological material that was becoming available was on view in the British Museum, was visited by artists such as this one here, uh, Edward Pointer who painted this scene uh, using actual objects he'd seen in the British Museum. Um, uh, and uh, this shows Rhodopis, who was a Greek courtesan in ancient, in ancient Egypt, commissioning one of the pyramids. So it's rather an extraordinary story. But each of those objects we see in there, the fan, the furniture, the jewellery she's wearing, is actually based on real archaeological um, material. That's interesting because we, of course, think about and know about artists going to galleries and copying and, and obviously looking very intently. But it's interesting to also think about them going to places like the British Museum, oh, yes. looking at objects. I, I mean, as you would, those sarcophagi with their painted faces mm. are extraordinary. Of course, it's also, this is also interesting to me, having a company called Seventh Art Productions, constantly being, you know, having to explain the seven arts, which is a little bit here. Um, I think... Uh, the other thing I just wanted to point out is that you made reference to Ruskin. Uh, just to point out, I, I, um, I've done another podcast with Matthew where we talked about a painting uh, of Ruskin by uh, Millet, and you can find that on the, on the website as well. Um, Victorian, it's, it's, it's a pure coincidence that we're talking about this piece, but... Um, we have in development, and you know, development doesn't mean it will ever come to anything, I'm afraid, these days, um, a project about Victorians and pleasure. And this has arisen because where I'm based in Brighton, we're next to a building uh, which is an extraordinary Victorian building with a, 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 a dome that where the top used to revolve and... Um, uh, a huge uh, um, theatrical space within it. The, they got a basement where they used to keep an, an elephant at one time, which they'd bring on stage, and then it became a, it's an extraordinary place. It became a concert hall where the Rolling Stones played and various others, and then it be, became a bingo hall, and then it was left to rack and ruin, and people thought it would be torn down or become apartments. Actually, somebody has taken it over and is restoring it to its former glory. Fantastic. And we were thinking about a project about that, but also then looking at some of the extraordinary things that they had in Brighton, which is where I live. For example, and this is the Victorians just enjoying themselves, there was an a, a, um, elevated railway out to sea, and you can still see the kind of concrete base of it. It was about, I don't know what, 50 metres into the water, but you, it was like, almost like an elevated tram that would go along from obviously one point to the other, but you were out to sea up high. If you went out to the countryside, not far, three miles, five kilometres from the seafront, get to a place called Devil's Dyke, there was a little train that went up there. When you got there, there was a cable car across the dyke itself. There was a funicular that went down the other side. And so all, all these things which were to entertain. Mm. But again, when you start looking at this history, as you say, it's not just the dour... No, not at all. ...kind of grim mills of Sheffield and Manchester and Macclesfield and all the rest of those kind of places, but actually there was also this desire, maybe as much as today, for pleasure, for colour, for entertainment, and which is what this bookcase speaks to. Well, Burgess was enormously good fun. 
And he, he knew Rossetti, he knew the whole pre Raphaelite group and everyone else. So, yeah, the, the idea that Victorians were stuffy, and, and I mean, this cabinet is full of jokes, it's full of puns. There's a, there's a rather a wonderful little piece here by, by Burgess himself, which shows the death of who killed Cock Robin, and, and the, uh, the, the rook with his little book here, mm -hmm. which um, is written upside down, so you know you read it from above, only to be read by birds. You know, these little visual puns that he was coming in. And there are lots of rather wonderful jokes in here that only Burgess and his close circle of uh, academic friends who were all classically sort of educated and, and, and um, rather well-traveled could get. So, for example, this shows here um, Sappho, the, the ancient, um, ancient poet. Um, and this is one of the stories about Sappho, uh, where she falls in love with this beautiful young man who was rowing her across, uh, across the, the water. So this is top right, where we see uh, a lady dressed in green and a man dressed in white rowing yeah. across the water. Now, she, what's very interesting about this, there was a whole debate about Sappho at this time, and up until really this point, Sappho's uh, uh, sort of lesbian poetry, where she, uh, it, for which we now know her best, had been slightly kind of um, uh, washed away or slightly tr mistranslated deliberately so. And actually in the 1860s, 1850s, uh, Swinburne, Algernon Swinburne, who was the academic here in Oxford, Kind of re, 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 reclaimed her lesbian kind of writing uh, and started to, 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 to translate her properly. So, you know, we know who she's writing about other women, not, not men, for example. Now, Swinburne was famously ginger, redhead. And this scene, which shows a, uh, a supposedly ancient Greek man uh, rowing her across the water, has a shock of red hair and a very prominent moustache, which Swinburne also had. And we think this is Swinburne. Now, what's interesting is Algernon's, Algernon Swinburne. Algernon was his first name. Algernon is derived from the old French, meaning bewhiskered or large moustache. And he had a little straggly ginger moustache. And you can see what's happened here. He's been given a huge, big, bushy moustache. And we think this is a joke. This is a joke on Algernon's name, uh, because Algernon and was leading, actually, it's an academic joke because he's, he's researching Sappho, but also he's, he's actually been included in the painting here. Uh, he's a funny looking fellow, actually, but um, th th this, is, this has made him a bit better looking than he would be in real life. But it's quite that kind of level of, of, of kind of joke that's going on that only swim, that only Burgess and his friends could understand. So when this was shown at the, Crystal, at the International Exhibition of 1862, many people were completely horrified by it. They didn't understand it. They, didn't, um, they just didn't get how it was all connected. It's all, all very intimately connected up, but you've got to know that. You've got to know the kind of links there. And when it was shown, it was shown as an art object or yes. it, and, but it was, it was destined for his own, his own salon. But he was designing pieces for other wealthy clients. I and mean, he was quite lucky, Burgess, because he's actually from a wealthy background, so he didn't have to work. So he was a kind of gentleman architect. So, so he was only able to do work, work that he wanted to do. And he ended up working for the Earl of Butte in Cardiff. And Cardiff Castle, if you've got the chance to go down there, is, 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 is a kind of entire castle designed like this. He restored the castle and put in these extraordinary Gothic revival interiors where money was no object, because Butte was one of the wealthy men in the world at the time. Um, but he said he was also a great pleasure lover, so there were lots of jokes. He loved birds, so this whole sort of... Um, I mean, the cabinet works on many levels. So, in fact, although we've got the, the pagan and the Christian arts, if you look at it going from the, the base upwards, there's another story going on, because we've got all these amazing fish and seashells. And these stencils you see here... Uh, if you look at them, they, they don't look Gothic. They actually look Japanese. And he's been inspired by the new Japanese mm. art. Japan had just opened up to the West again in the 1850s, and Burgess was one of the first people to collect their, mm. their art. Japanese and he wrote, yes, and actually, and at 1862, the International Exhibition, it's the first time Japanese, modern Japanese art had been shown to the public. And he described that as the true medieval art. It was a pre-industrial society, and he, he saw these amazing links between the medieval world of Europe and contemporary Japan. So did you say 18 1862. 1862. Oh, yeah. so that's a little bit earlier. Cause I always think of 1868 as being the moment when. Well, it's the Meiji Restoration, of yeah. course, that happens then. But before that point, um, uh, it was opened up in 1856. I think was when Commander Perry opened uh, forces. Yes. Japan, sends the gunboats in and forces Japan to open yes, up yes, this yes. enclosed, um, uh, enforced kind of isolation from the West, particularly. Yeah. Uh, and so suddenly, all this contemporary Japanese art starts coming out, and um, we know that Burgess collected that. His albums still survive of Japanese objects. What? What is it like inside? Is it well, decorated? Well, if I say, it, it, you've got the fish on the base, and it comes up, and you've got this amazing kind of inlaid marbles from India and from Japan. Yeah, they're beautiful. Yes. So they're the, they're, they're the minerals in the earth. 
there. So you've got the there's fishes in the sea, the minerals in the earth, these lovely little roundels above that. They're all little sprites that are emblematic of the um, metals. My favourite one here is a little one here. See this little sprite? He's, he's the third, third one from the left. He's sparking two copper wires, so ah, he's copper. Of and then above that, you've got the plants growing on the surface of the earth in the four seasons. And then above that, you've got the animals walking on the surface of the earth, and these are all Aesop's fables here. And then above that, the birds and the insects of the air. Amazing. Now, classically for Burgess, he, he likes to have jokes, so he's chosen to represent birds that tend to walk on the ground rather than fly. So okay. we've, got, we've got a fantailed dove, we've got parrots, and we've got a cockerel. But also hummingbirds and exotic beetles, this kind of new interest in the, in the, in the, in the, in the tropical world. Mm. And then above that, we've got the birds that are shown in Aristophanes' play, um, The Birds. And that's what we call today cloud cuckoo land, this kind of magical um, huh. world of the birds above that. Above that, the sun, and then above that, the stars. And then in the very top, we've got these um, three arched pictures, which um, show in the centre art by Burne Jones, flanked by religion and love, and that's oh. heaven. So, so that's St. Burgess's idea of heaven. So it works on many different levels as this cabinet. So that's interesting. So he's actually positioning art as, Art's at the centre, yes, absolutely. As, as, because I, uh, only recently we were having this conversation about this, the belief that art is the highest form of human mm. creativity. And I guess that's yeah, yes. Burgess is completely absolutely. buying into that and putting, absolutely. you know, the position of what would normally be Mary or God or yeah. Jesus, he's placed art. And she looks like a, a kind of Madonna figure, actually, mm. as you see that. And she's holding this extraordinary kind of glass globe in her hand is kind of like a crystal ball which Burgess which Burn Jones goes on to recreate elsewhere what we don't know is how much control each individual artist had over yeah, the, yeah. and I think you know Bur I think Burgess had a lot of control over the artists um, so for example Stacey Marks who did a lot of the, uh, the lower panels we know that he writes about uh, some of the panels inside the door that they're the only things he was allowed to do by Burgess uncoached, he oh, says. Okay. But when you open it, you see also these panels and these stencils again, which show flying fish and seahorses and insects, uh, dragonflies and, and um, spiders. Again, very Japanese. I think he's looking at Japanese sort of art and combining it with kind of French 14th century Gothic art. And you create something that can only be 19th century. I mean, the size of it and the sheer scale and splendour of this can only have been produced in the 19th century, really. Now, it's a very minor question, but you know how some people these days organise their books colour-coded, <laughs> which I, I think is actually kind of crazy. But do you think, is there any evidence, does he ever write about what he had inside, whether it was just alphabet? We alphabet don't know. I mean, we, the, we only know about his, his books because there's a sale of his collection in the 1880s after his death. Oh. So we know what he had in his library. And he was very well read. He had a great library and, um, you know, was able to read uh, Latin, Greek, uh, French. So he was very, um, and I, I say was very well travelled around Europe. And, and, and um, so, you know, he was quite an exceptional person. He was so short-sighted, though, that it was joked that he once mistook a peacock for one of his friends, So, because he was that short-sighted, which wow. is partly possibly why there's so much intense detail Gee. on this here. But he was great fun. He was also a bit of an opium smoker as well. And, uh, you know, but... Uh, and we were talking about Victorians and pleasure, of course. You know, he has these wild parties and, you know, with his kind of friends in London and his house, which is um, in London. It's just around the corner from Leighton House, if you know that, in Kensington. Uh, his house is now lived in by Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. And he built this extraordinary house in the 1870s and moved this cabinet from his earlier house to this house called Tower, Tower House in Kensington, and it has this extraordinary surviving interior, which various famous people have lived in, but Jimmy Page has lived there since the 1970s. He's a great collector of Victorian art, and he lives in this house. Really? Uh, uh, and it's truly extraordinary. Have you, have you... No, I've never managed to get in, which is um, something I would like to do, because actually the library, which is still there, was designed around this great bookcase. That's what I was going to ask about what do we know... I mean, was, did this go into a room where everything was painted? Yeah. Like, and I mean, everything. I, I live near Charleston, so it's kind of... No, completely. No, even more so. I mean, completely. If you imagine this, all over the walls, the ceiling, the fireplaces, everywhere. And in fact, the library is rather sweet. It has this dining, it has this large fire surround, and the workman is chiselling the alphabet. Mm. Uh, and for a joke, this is very typical Burgess, the H has dropped because the workmen are dropping, because they're Cockney, <laughs> they're dropping their H's, so the H has kind of dropped down. So that's, that's again, that's kind of Burgess's kind of sense of humour that he sort of had. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Now it's, it's very easy for us to default to this term Victorian 
And um, I was talking to someone the other day about a completely separate subject, but about Afghanistan, and I was saying that the mine in which my character in this film works in, it's Victorian. And I thought, well, actually, they might not understand that term. So my question is this. When we're talking about Victorians and colour and pleasure, do you think that applied throughout Europe, or is it something specifically... British. Ah, that's a difficult one. Well, of course, in Victorian, it generally means British, but the Americans also use Victorian. But it, for us, it means the period between 1837 and 1901 when Queen Victoria ruled. So it's a very long period and a very sort of very uh, changeable period. You know, it's, it's incredibly complicated. So I would tend to associate it with Britain. Of course, Britain's at the forefront of the Industrial Revolution, um, particularly within Europe. So you have different terms for different countries in Europe. So in France, for example, you've got various regimes coming in. You've got the Second Empire for the Third Republic. You know, these sort of periods that had their own very distinct identities within other countries. So I would say Victorian means predominantly okay. Britain and also the expanding empire, of course, you know, because we talk about Victorian architecture in Bombay, for example, this extraordinary kind of Gothic this kind of style architecture in this Indian city, which the, the Victorians were deliberately using to, to show this kind of this Western kind of um, um, uh, dominance in, in, in the Eastern world. So, just in terms of influences, when European artists or predominantly French artists come here in 1870 during the Franco Prussian War, do you think that they would have seen this kind of thing and just been, you know, it would have been something new to them, something as much as they were influenced by Constable and Turner and things like that, this also had an influence on them in some way? It does go both ways, actually, yes. And Turner has a huge influence, and the Pyrophilites have an influence, but in, they've, they've also got their own stories, and in fact, it's a two-way influence going on there. So the Gothic revival is also happening in France, of course, and um, so um, you know, it's not just happening here, but there are different movers and shakers and different aspects of, the, of it there. Than, um, uh, and then, of course, later in the century, we do, you know, the arts and crafts movement, and people like William Morris do have a huge influence on, on our continental sort of um, neighbours. Um, so, uh, so yes, it's a two-way thing. And particularly uh, later in the 19th century, you get this cosmopolitanism going on, you know, where you know, France, uh, Paris and London have this kind of elite artists who move between these and New York and other, other cities as well. Somebody like Oscar Wilde, for example, is, is, is just as well known in France as he is over here, you know, as part of that kind of late 19th century kind of decadent movement that's going on. And finally, what happens to um, William... Does he... I mean, you mentioned, obviously, that he dies and his, these objects are uh, sold off and handed out, but after this work, did he do similar works? Well, after this, he then goes on to really work for Butte, as I said, in Cardiff, and creates his great masterpieces, which are Cardiff Castle and Castel Koch, which is just outside of Cardiff, which is an enti entirely rebuilt medieval castle, which was unfinished at the time of his death in 1881, but was finished off shortly afterwards. So yes, you know, he was you know he was very well regarded, and then of course goes completely out of fashion with modernism. This kind of very high Victorian art, very very elaborate. And in fact, this cabinet itself has changed because when he moved into his new house, the one lived in by Jimmy Page in 1876, um, the cabinet fell over, um, and there must have been uh, it wasn't quite properly fixed, I don't think. And in the restoration, they simplified the decoration. So you'll see on the front of it these kind of fairly plain bands of red with simple gold decoration, and on the top. The, the top of the arches is just plain gold. When this was first done in the 1860s, if you look at photographs, it had lots even even more Gothic detailing going on there. And uh, by the 1870s, that Gothic style was going out of fashion, and the kind of Japanese style was coming in. And I, if you look at these, these have a kind of Japanese simplicity to them. And I think this is what's coming in: this aesthetic movement, simplicity that's coming in. So, so he does move slightly with the times, but of course, you know, after the 19th century, this kind of stuff is beyond the pale to many modernists. And, and when Tower House is sold in 1933. Uh, most of the contents are auctioned off, and this is one of the things that was bought by Kenneth Clark, who was the uh, uh, was a young um, curator here, at the keeper here at the Ashmolean for a couple of years. And during his time as a young man here, he made some extraordinary foresighted 
um, acquisitions, and this was one of them. So when it was bought in 33, nobody else was going to buy this. It was completely unfashionable. He bought it for £50, and he writes in the register, you know, although not acceptable to present taste, you know, it's a very important document of pre-Raphaelite furniture. Uh, but, but it was felt that they couldn't really show it, so it was shunted away, and it's only after 80 years later that it came back, you know, and it's now in its full glory in the cab here. And the same with Burgess's reputation, really, from up until really the 19... 19- 60s, 1970s, with that rediscovery of the Victorians and a new appreciation of the Victorians after a long period of really despising this kind of heavy Victorian architecture, precisely because people thought of it as being heavy and oppressive or sometimes dark and gloomy. Um, it's been reassessed and now, of course, people love it. And if you go to Cardiff Castle, it's a hugely popular venue for people to get married in, for example. Or, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful space. And this cabinet looks terrific here, surrounded by you know, uh, one, one, you know, one of the world's most important collections of pure Raphaelite paintings. So this is what I think Kenneth Clark had wanted it to achieve. Uh, we've also got another piece of furniture in this room, which was made for William Morris, which is on the other side. It's a wardrobe, which was presented to William Morris um, on his wedding to Jane Burden in 1859 in Oxford uh, by his friend Edward Burne Jones. So um, uh, this cabinet works very well with that, that piece of furniture. Matthew, absolutely brilliant. And there is so much to see in the Ashmolean Museum, but it's definitely worth a date just to come here to the 19th century art room and just spend the whole afternoon, the whole morning uh, in this one specific room. Matthew, thank you very much. And that's it for this week's, I'll call it artwork of the week. Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at 7th-art.com or contact us by emailing info at 7th-art.com. See you next time.